Yo, my name is Kevin, and this is Some Cinema. The film I want to take a look at today is Christopher Nolan's World War II tour de force, Dunkirk. One thing Nolan consistently likes to play with is time. That includes reversing it, slowing it down, bending it, and in Dunkirk, rearranging it. And the reason he can do all this while still riveting audiences is in large part due to his mastery of a specific skill, building a sequence. A sequence is a group of consecutive scenes that together tell a larger narrative. Fights and chases are probably the most easily identifiable sequences, but really any group of scenes can qualify as one. Let's take a look at a pretty standard one in Shrek. Near the beginning of the film, we get a scene where Shrek learns of the squatters in his swamp, and who's responsible for them being there. By who? Lord Farquaad. He hoofed and he poofed and he signed an eviction notice. The next scene introduces Farquaad, along with his evil intentions. Fairy tale crash poisoning my perfect world. Now tell me, where are the others? And romantic pursuits. You've chosen Princess Fiona. Followed by Shrek and Donkey arriving in Duloc to a warm welcome. Please keep up on the grass, shine your shoes, wipe your face. And before we know it, they're face to face. Is that? Ugh, it's hideous. Oh, that's not very nice. It's just a donkey. That sequence is about 11 minutes and effectively communicates the desires of the key characters and how they connect in a straightforward way. But that just isn't enough to satisfy Christopher Nolan. He seeks to challenge audiences by giving them an experience that's different from what they're used to. If filmmaking's a video game, then Nolan only plays on expert. In Dunkirk, he's weaving between three sets of characters in three distinct locations over three different periods of time. Yeah, but Nolan didn't just do this for fun. The, the specific structure, it's a result of this conundrum, this problem of, okay, how do you keep the audience in the human scale of the events, but give everybody a bigger understanding or the understanding they need of the wider events? In other words, I didn't want to cut to generals in rooms, right. moving things around on maps and explaining The usual things. war movie. The usual war movie trope. Are withdrawn or are trying to withdraw to the French coast, to Dunkirk. And so immediately I start to realize, okay, I need to base my structure on different scales of timeline and how they would converge at a point. Basically, Nolan only wanted to give the audience the first-hand perspectives of this historical event, and combine them in a way that would give a more complete view of the story. Let's take a look at one of the many sequences he and editor Lee Smith put together in order to accomplish this. For clarity, I'll call this thread with the soldiers, Mole, this thread with the pilots, Air, and this thread with the civilians, Sea. This sequence near the beginning of the film starts with two soldiers carrying an injured one across the beach to a medical ship. Ready on the start! All the way! The ship's about to leave! About to leave! Along the mall, along we the then mall. jump to the sea thread, as the civilians are also getting ready to depart, but from the safe shores of Great Britain. Next, we go to the air, where the pilots prepare for the coming fight as they head towards Dunkirk. We cut back to the mole as the soldiers navigate a crowded and damaged path. Take a run on it! Before finally managing to reach the medical ship. Back in the sea thread, before the Navy can commandeer their boat, the civilians embark on their own with an unexpected addition. What are you doing? You do know where we're going. Into war, George! I'll be useful, sir. We return to the air just as the pilots make first contact with the enemy. Jumping back to the mole, the soldiers are promptly kicked off the medical ship. Their attempt to sneak off Dunkirk denied. Both of you, off you go. Off you go! We briefly return to the sea for the last time in the sequence, as the civilians hit the open water on their way to Dunkirk. It's followed by our final trip to the air, where the pilots coordinate to take down the enemy plane. Clear up. 
And then the sequence ends where it began, in the mole thread. As the soldiers hide under the dock, waiting for the next ship, and overhear their superiors talk of their dire situation. How many men are they talking about, sir? Churchill wants 30,000. Rams is hoping we can give him 45. There are 400,000 men on this beach, sir. We'll just have to do our best. And believe it or not, this sequence is only about 50 seconds longer than the one in Shrek. And this sequence accomplishes the same thing, but with far more story and characters to juggle. And on top of that, sets up an incredibly intense pace while effectively giving us a sense of the massive scope that this film is going to cover. Like what? Like that's ridiculous. Like, is, am I the only one who thinks this is ridiculous? Like I'm telling you, like what Nolan executes here and throughout the rest of this film is just, you know what? Chris Ryan from The Rewatchable said it best. It, it's hard to imagine this movie being imitated or topped. It, it does feel like it could only have been made by him and it could only have been told in the way that he told it. If you try to rearrange the movie in your head and say, okay, what would happen if you would cut it in a more linear fashion? It actually doesn't hold together as a gripping story the way it does, you know, the way he tells it. So you wind up really having something that's, it's a special kind of storytelling. It's only could have been done by him. When you boil it down, I think audiences love Nolan for the same reason they love Jackie Chan. They both go above and beyond. Jackie Chan does every stunt and every fight himself. And my man's got the scars to prove it. Nolan shoots on noisy, hulking IMAX cameras to get the highest quality image, and does as much as he possibly can for real, relying on VFX only as a supplement to what was achieved in camera. Because Nolan sets his difficulty so high, it can be argued he doesn't always pull it off. But when he does, we get a singular movie experience that nobody else can manufacture. Nolan has done all manner of things with time. But the one thing he will never do is waste it.